In a hardcore Nuzlocke, if a team member faints, it's gone forever. And with Diamond's team having an unevolved Munchlax, it's definitely gonna be an uphill battle. As a kid, I also never liked Sinnoh, so this will be my first time playing through Platinum, a game that many people agree is one of the harder ones in the series. I remember I didn't like the slow game engine or the very limited encounter pools because every playthrough would have basically the same team. But this playthrough made me see Sinnoh in a whole new light. All the boss fights were really fun, and I had to come up with some creative strategies to beat them. But that's enough spoilers, let's get started on our first adventure through Sinnoh. We start off in our room as Pearl barges in, telling us we gotta go find Professor Rowan. Um, haven't you heard of knocking? I'm never one to back down from an adventure, so we set out to look for him, but before we can step into the tall grass, Rowan stops us to give us a Pokemon to defend ourselves. We look at our options for a bit, but of course we go with True the Turtwig as our first team member. In the manga, Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum were traveling together, and Platinum thought they were meant to be her bodyguards. She entrusted Diamond with Turtwig and Pearl with Chimchar, so the two of them could fend off any wild Pokemon as they made their way through Sinnoh. With True on our team, we take out Pearl and get started on our adventure. As my first real venture into the Sinnoh region, I'm excited to see what Pokemon I can catch. Nothing. We can't catch anything yet. We've got True and only True to help us take on the first gym leader, and after pulling him out of the mines, we can take him on with our super effective grass moves. Geodude can't really do anything to us, so we can outspeed and one-shot him with the Razor Leaf. Onyx is up next, but he misses a Screech, and our Absorb nearly takes him out. Roar heals, but then we miss our next Razor Leaf. Onyx connects with a Screech, harshly lowering our defense as we connect with the Razor Leaf, but Onyx manages to hang on. Then, with his insane speed, Onyx outspeeds and hits us with the Rock Tomb, but not before we take him out with the final Absorb. Last up is Rourke's Cranidos, who outspeeds and nails us with a huge headbutt. Lesson learned here, I should have set up Hardens on Geodude, because if we miss this Razor Leaf, then we're toast. But true, the GOAT connects with a 95% accurate move, scoring the KO and winning us the battle. With the first gym badge acquired, that lets us use Rock Smash, so we head north of Jubilife to make more progress. That's where we find Professor Rowan confronting two Team Galactic grunts, and this man goes in on them. My man brings out the bullet points and roasts them five different ways before letting us have a piece too. You kids, don't grow up to be like these sorry specimens. Damn bro, you did not have to go so hard. You little guy, touch you! Go! Stop! He's already dead! We team up with Platinum and her Piplup to take them out before making our way over to the next town. Oh look, a wild Psyduck spice. I wonder what words he's gonna mispronounce. First up is Drapion. Drapion. Second is Skylar's ace, Swanana. Swanana. This time I have to take down the fire type trainer, Melia. Melia. Tulip starts with Tharatharig. Tharatharig. Third is Espira. Espira. So first out of our final three is Ortuga. Ortuga. I wish I could catch him, but Diamond doesn't use a Psyduck on his team, so instead, I'll just have to visit his channel to get my daily dose of Psyduck. With no new team members, some of these grunt battles can be challenging, especially the upcoming story at Valley Windworks. With opponents like Stumpy and Zubat, it's incredibly hard to take them out as they're resisting our stab attacks. But with some strategic maneuvering and a held Pecha Berry, we can outlast their resistances and emerge victorious, getting us the works key. Thank you, you surely saved me. Those goons were trying to rob me of my sweet, sweet honey. Oh, you poor old man. I miss the days when that word only had one meaning. With the works key obtained, we've got a boss fight coming up, and that's Mars and her Perugly. I know this one's a notorious run-ender, because a fully evolved Pokemon at this point in the game is gonna be tough to deal with, so I wanted to be prepared. I decided to hunt for the 1% Munchlax on the Honey Tree, which is probably the stupidest way to get a Pokemon, even dumber than Feebas and Hoenn. It takes 6 in-game hours to get an encounter, so I spent some time fast-forwarding, but ultimately no luck. It turns out, depending on your trainer ID and your secret ID, there's only 4 honey trees in the entire region that can have Munchlax. You're telling me it's not a flat 1% for all trees? So I checked my ID and nope, it's not this one. 
That leaves me with one option for the Mars fight, and that's to juice up True to be able to take on Perugly all on his own. First, we make sure to evolve into Grottle for the extra stats, which will make it easier to tank her attacks. Then, at level 20, we can easily take out her lead Zubat with a few tackles. Our held Pecha Berry comes in handy again and lets us shake off Zubat's Toxic, so we're sitting very comfortably by the time Perugly comes out. And through our high defenses, we can tank Perugly's Fake Out and Scratches as we fire back with Rock Smash for the clean 3-hit KO. That could have been scary, but we make it out of there with our Lone Wolf Grottle as we head to Eterna City. On the way there, there are a few mandatory trainers, including this whole section with Cheryl. But with no one to share XP with and all these mandatory double battles, True unfortunately gains too much XP, leveling up to level 21, then level 22, and then finally level 23. That means we're above the level cap, and with no other team members, we've gotta reset the run. Fortunately, we're only one badge deep, so it shouldn't take long. This time, to make sure Rourke is consistent, we set up Withdraw on his Geodude to boost our defense for Cranidos. Geodude can barely touch us with Rock Throw, and we can take him out with an Absorb while recovering back our health. Onyx can't touch us either, so a single Razor Leaf takes him out. Then, it's the moment of truth as Cranidos also fails to make a dent, letting us take him out with a few attacks. Technically, we would have been dead to a crit since that would bypass our defense boosts, but all we can do is cross our fingers and hope for the best. A quick trek back to Floroma Town, and we've just caught up with the last attempt. That difficult grunt battle from before gave us a little more trouble since Zubat kept flinching us with Astonish, but we just barely squeaked by on 1 HP to complete that mini gauntlet. Now, we're at a bit of an impasse here, because if we level up too much, then we would risk over leveling again. But if we don't level up enough, our stats aren't good enough to handle Mars and her Perugly. The only encounter we can get now is Munchlax, but unfortunately luck isn't on our side, as a honey tree calculator showed that our four viable honey trees were placed after the second badge. So with none of these trees being able to produce a Munchlax, what can we do? Well, using a little bit of genetic modification, we can change the DNA of this tree to make it produce munchlaxes through a process of altering its chemical thresholds to influence the organization of nurturing... Okay, fine, it's action replay. But this is me balancing Game Freak's awful decision making because why didn't they make munchlax a flat 1% across every tree? That's like, instead of having a 20% gibble encounter in Wayward Cave, it's instead found on 10 random tiles, so happy searching. Well, regardless, we shake the tree and find her Munchlax, who's even holding the leftovers, so that passive recovery is gonna be huge at this point in the game. We catch him and name him Lax, and in the manga, Lax was a pretty lazy guy, just like his trainer. If he wasn't out relaxing, then he was probably eating whatever piece of food he could get his hands on. Honestly, my spirit animal, but more than that, he's also our ticket to getting past this XP roadblock. We lead with him against Mars Zubat, and even though Zubat outspeeds and flinches us with a bite, on the next turn, we're able to fire off a stab tackle, which brings Zubat down to the yellow. So another tackle later, and we've managed to take him out without risking any toxic damage on True. Mars sends out Perugly, so I switch into True on the turn she uses Fake Out. On the next turn, we get outsped and need to tank a scratch, but then we can set up a curse of our own, boosting our defenses and giving us the upper hand. Perugly's next feint attack barely makes a dent, and she even procs her Orenberry, but we use Rock Smash for a clean two-shot. Perugly goes down, and Mars is defeated while keeping our team at a low enough level for the upcoming battles through Eterna Forest. With Cheryl rescued, we arrive at Eterna City for our next gym challenge. Here, we meet Cyrus at the Dialga slash Palkia statue, which blew my mind when someone pointed out that it was supposed to look like Dialga and Palkia at the same time. In this configuration, it looks like these are the hind legs forming Dialga, and in this configuration, it looks like these are arms forming Palkia. The manga does a really cool recreation of the statue, but of course the remakes had to mess it up. Before we take on Gardenia, we explore around the city, including checking out the underground to grab the armor fossil. But since the rock-type Shieldon can hardly help us out against the grass-type gym leader, I didn't bother to backtrack for this one. 
Instead, we run around a bunch to boost Lax's friendship, not for the friendship evolution, but for our strategy against Gardenia. She leads with her own Turtwig, and we start the battle with Lax. Turtwig sets up a Reflect, but with our maxed out friendship, we can still deal a significant amount of damage with Return. On the next turn, Turtwig hits us with the Razor Leaf, as our Return brings him down to the red. This causes Gardenia to heal, so we continue using Return until we can finally take the turtle out. Our Leftovers is keeping us healthy in the meantime, but before going down, Turtwig sets up a sunny day for her incoming Cherim, activating her Flower Gift ability and causing her to change forms. She sets up a safeguard as we fire off Return to nearly take her out. Gardenia keeps trying to heal, but we keep bringing her down to yellow HP. As a last ditch effort, Cherim tries to use Grass Knot, but we can easily tank it and take her out with the return. Last up is her Roserade, who fires off a powerful Grass Knot, but our follow up return barely misses out on the one shot. We tank another Grass Knot and take out Roserade, winning us the battle and her second gym badge. Lax tries to evolve, but I'm sorry buddy, you gotta stay as a Munchlax since Diamond never evolved you. With the HM for Cut now at our disposal, we can make our way back through Eterna Forest to explore the old chateau, even impressing the babes with our bravery. We enter alone and nearly run into the ghost girl, but we're able to dodge any lingering spirits and make our way over to the haunted TV to grab the static Rotom encounter. In the manga, Rotom attacked our trio in the old chateau and even followed them into Eterna City where it used the appliances to further terrorize them. Diamond ended up bonding with it, and they realized that the prankster was only trying to play with them. So, with Rotom on our team, we can change its forms in the Galactic Building for all new strategies, but in the Gen 4 games, when Rotom changes its form, it doesn't actually get a new type. We're stuck with Electric Ghost, but that ghost typing and its immunities are gonna be huge for our playthrough. Oh, also, Diamond never gives him a nickname, so sticking with the three-letter motif, I named him Rom as a reference to how most of us play these old games nowadays. Before we can even think of changing forms though, we need to clear through Team Galactic and take out the boss fight here, Commander Jupiter. She's another notorious run-ender, as her Skun Tank can dish out serious damage with Night Slash. She leads with Zubat, and I send out our new team member Rom, who can one-shot the Blind Bat with a single Shockwave. This brings out her Skun Tank, and since she's definitely going for a Night Slash, I switch into True to tank it. We're holding on to the leftovers, so we can start using Rock Smash, which even gets a critical hit on the first attack, and also lowers her defense on top of that. We tank the next Night Slash, and connect with the second Rock Smash, getting a second defense drop. Skun Tank Citrus Berry restores some health, and even though our Leftovers is keeping us healthy, we're absolutely dead to a crit, so I switch into Lax to tank them. Then, a max powered return, combined with the double defense drop, is enough to take out Skun Tank and win us a difficult battle. One mistimed crit, and we could've lost someone, but like last time, we don't have many options besides crossing our fingers and hoping for the best. Now that Team Galactic's been cleared out, we could switch Rom to a superior wash or oven form, but I decided to keep him for now so we could spend time with his base form. Instead, with our newly acquired bike, we can backtrack to Orberg City to revive our armor fossil for our next team member, Don the Shield On. In the manga, Don was originally owned by Byron, but the two of them struggled to get along. Instead, he got along better with Diamond, and Byron decided to let the two of them travel together. Don would act as the tank in their journey, and in a tense showdown against Team Galactic, he tanked 5 different attacks at the same time, even evolving into Bastiodon before taking out all 5 attackers with an iron head. Back in our adventures, we head through Mount Coronet where we bump into Cyrus again. The way he towers over us in this confined space is such a cool way to add some pressure to these small interactions, and also, this room being the one that we traverse through later on to get to Spear Pillar is so cool. And with that, we can make our way to Heart Home City and- oh hey Baneri! If it weren't for you, who knows how far my Baneri could have run. Lady, you need to take better care of your Pokemon. I'm Kira, I'm a Pokemon contest judge. Be sure to drop by the contest hall so I can thank you properly. Um, look, I'm flattered, but I'm gonna pass. Also, you're getting reported to the Contest Fairness Committee for such blatant cheating and bribery. Inside Heart Home, we can also find the first organized religion in the Pokemon world. 
Make sure that you never judge a Pokemon on if it's weak or strong. Yeah, I'm sure you and Karen would have some amazing conversations together. Maybe you should talk to her. We can't go any further since these random reporters are blocking you, so we need to get geared up to take on Fantina. She uses ghost types, which could spell trouble for our team, but with the right berries, I'm confident in our strategy. She leads with Duskull, and I start the battle with Lax. We're immune to their ghost attacks, but in return, they're immune to our powerful returns. On turn 1, Duskull outspeeds and lands a Will-O-Wisp, having our physical attack, but our held Rossberry lets us shake it off and fire back with a lick. That's our only ghost coverage, and at 20 base power, it actually makes a decent dent. Duskull hits us with a Pursuit, and another lick can bring her down to the yellow. Duskull then lands a second Will-O-Wisp, but Lax fires back with the critical hit to nearly take her out. Fantina definitely heals here, so I use this turn of momentum to switch into Dawn. We can use Swagger to not only confuse Duskull, but also boost her physical attack to cause her to hit herself for more damage. And right away, Duskull fails to land a hit and hits itself for a decent amount of damage. On the next turn, we can outspeed and use Taunt, which prevents her from using Will-O-Wisp on us, rendering her useless for this turn for the second time. Then, immediately after, Duskull gets a second self hit, and to rub extra salt in the wound, we use another Swagger to make her hits do more damage. Since Shadow Sneak does the most damage, I'm expecting her to use that as I switch into Lax, and it pays off, but at a significant price. Duskull snaps out of confusion, and her taunt wears off, so now we're at risk to a strong attack. Her pursuit doesn't do enough, as we fire back with Lick, which gets the para. So a little more back and forth, and Duskull goes down, although we're barely alive at 1 HP. Haunter comes out next, and we've gotta switch. I send out True, as Haunter only goes for Sucker Punch, and on the next turn, Haunter outspeeds and lands a Confuse Ray, but we're able to break through it and set up a curse. We dodge the incoming Hypnosis, and with our buffed up stats, we fire off a Razor Leaf, which even though Haunter resists it, is now a two shot thanks to the curse. Haunter then goes for a Sucker Punch, but thanks to our defense boost, we easily tank it, and we break through for a Razor Leaf, which misses. Our bad luck doesn't end there as Haunter successfully connects with the Hypnosis, putting us to sleep. But with our held leftovers and our defense boost, I decided to stay in and we immediately wake up on the next turn to set up another curse. Now Haunter's the one in trouble as we tank another Shadow Claw before taking her out with another Razor Leaf. Her ace Miss Magius is last, and she immediately outspeeds and confuses us with a Confuse Ray, but True breaks through and connects with a plus 2 Razor Leaf, getting the clean one shot, and oh no. Miss Magius gets some health back with the Citrus Berry, but now it's time to roll the dice again. She outspeeds with a Shadow Ball, which we can comfortably tank, as True, being the absolute goat, snaps out and connects with another Razor Leaf, finishing her off and winning us our third gym badge. We barely made it out of that one, and just between you and me, I was totally willing to let Lax go down because he's starting to struggle to pull his weight in these battles. We make our way through the next route, and this is probably my lack of exposure to Sinnoh, but I climbed all the way up the little tower here, and the two grannies tell me that I need to use Defog. I don't even have Defog unlocked yet, so there's just nothing I can do at this point. And then, I can't even use an escape rope to get out of here, I have to walk all the way back down. Very odd level design, but we can come back later to see what these grannies are hiding. We make our way through to Salacion Town, where we can pick up a few items. If you get me Pokemon that look like letters, I'll give you some seals. Well, say less buddy, because right next door is Salacion Ruins, where we can hunt for an unknown D. We actually get it as our first encounter, so I catch him and name him D. In the manga, our trio briefly befriended an unknown D and unknown P, with D for diamond and P for pearl. These unknown needed our group's help to free their friends trapped in the Salacion ruins, but they never officially joined their teams. I know unknown is generally seen as a weak or useless Pokemon, but this unknown actually has a ground type as their hidden power, which we can see as Rom dodges the attack with Levitate. That's going to be decently useful at this point in the game, since True doesn't get ground coverage yet, and our other ground option isn't obtainable until much later. So, with our new team member, we storm back into that house to collect our reward, the seal for the letter D. 
I spell out the letter D using our letter Ds and we can test it out on ROM. If we had more letters, then maybe we could spell out something funnier, but for now, I'm happy with our little customization. Up north of Salacion, we can also get our next encounter, a Lickitung named Kit. In the manga, Kit started off as a Lickitung looking for trouble, as he used his long tongue to steal a Poketch. Diamond, dressed up as one of the Jubilife clowns, helped track him down to battle him, and Lickitung used Rollout. It rolled through Diamond's team like they were a bunch of bowling pins, and while battling against Dawn, it started evolving into Licky Licky. Okay, the translators did this guy so dirty. The pedometer? Bruh. Yeah, I heard this guy was just here to get a cupcake. Whoa, I was actually coming out here to pick up a cupcake. It's supposed to be the pedometer, which is an app on the Poketch that lets Diamond count steps to track down the wild Licky Licky. Diamond's able to catch him and add him to the team, and back in our adventure, we managed to do the same, rounding out our team to 6 members. Now, our next gym challenge is against Maylene at Veilstone City, and unfortunately, I made a big mistake here. While getting the team to the level cap, I accidentally pressed B while True was trying to evolve, and since we evolve at 32 and the level cap is exactly 32, we don't have any room to level up to get our evolution. But I wasn't too worried, since Rom does such a good job of hard countering her team. Her fighting types can't touch us with their normal and fighting attacks, and our levitate allows us to dodge Lucario's bone rush. I'll try not to make the battle too trivial with them though. So, as Maylene leads with Meditite, I start the battle with our unevolved True. We get faked out on the first turn, but Leftover's recovery keeps us healthy. We trade a strong Razor Leaf for Meditite's weak Rock Tomb, but that does drop our speed. Meditite's able to outspeed and hit us with a Drain Punch, but we can tank it and take her out with our next Razor Leaf. This immediately baits out Lucario, so it's time to bring out the Ace up our sleeve. I switch into D on a resisted force palm, and on the next turn, we tank a metal claw before landing a powerful hidden power ground. Oh, I guess that was a crit. I, um, okay, maybe unknown is pretty trash. I switch back into true to tank the next metal claw before tanking a drain punch on the next turn. This lets us use rock smash, but we just barely miss out on the kill. We go back and forth a bit, but true takes him out and secures us the KO. Then, against Machoke, I finally switch Rom in on a Rock Tomb, but the good news is, that's all Machoke has to hit us with. A Thunderbolt from the Veilstone game corner can finish him off, winning us a simple badge number 4. Upon leaving the gym, we help Platinum get her Pokedex back from Team Galactic, where Kit finally levels up to level 33 and learns Rollout. That lets us evolve into Licky Licky as we make our way down towards Pastoria City. Dawn also evolves here, since I didn't bother with his levels back in the Maylene fight as he would have died to any of their fighting attacks. Now, before we go too far, there are a few things I want to knock out. First, we make our way back to Eterna City to finally give Rotom an appliance to use. I went with Rotom Wash since our team has a pretty glaring weakness to fire types, especially Pearl's Infernape. We also catch a Staravia to use Defog, just because I wanted to see what the deal was with those two grannies at the top of that tower, and they gave me a cleanse tag and a spell tag. Bruh. Nice, glad I did all that work for this. You guys suck, I much prefer my bathing grannies at Lava Ridge Town, at least they give you the why not egg. Back in Pastoria City, we get ready to challenge Crasher Wake, but first Pearl wants to go. We can easily take care of his team, including using our new Hydro Pump to obliterate his Monferno. And against Crasher Wake, it's a pretty similar story. He leads with Gyarados, but a quad effective Thunderbolt absolutely destroys the poor guy. Floatzel comes out next, who manages to hit us with a hard crunch, but an Orenberry can heal us up a bit as we take him out with another Thunderbolt. Last up is his ace Quagsire, but a quick switch into True and a single Razor Leaf later, and Quagsire finally goes down, winning us our 5th gym badge. By the way, I even messed up the level cap because I thought it was 36, but I guess that's just how easy this fight is. As we leave the gym, there's some Team Galactic stuff to take care of, but we can easily beat them to impress Cynthia. She gives us the secret potion, so we can finally clear through the group of Psyduck Spice to make our way to Celestic Town. There's a Cyrus battle here, but it's not noteworthy at all. Don takes care of Sneasel, as well as his follow-up Golbat, and Kit steps in to take care of his Murkrow. With our new Surf HM, we can now make our way to Canalave City, where the next infamous run-ender is. 
Pearl's here with a beefed up team and he's rocking an entire Heracross. His Infernape's also fully evolved and it was at this moment that I realized how weak we are to fighting attacks. They're both gonna have close combat later and although Rom is our only switch in, they always have ghost coverage like Night Slash or Shadow Claw. So this once goofy guy is now our number one threat. I did a lot of prep for this fight and let's see if it all pays off. He leads with Staraptor as I start the battle with Rom. Staraptor's Intimidate doesn't affect our special attacks as we can fire off with a Thunderbolt for the nice and easy one shot. This baits out Floatzel because he sees a super effective pursuit, but our held Colberberry can reduce that damage. In all honesty, I didn't realize Floatzel would come in so early because this berry wasn't meant for his weak pursuit. Still though, it lets us tank the attack better as we fire back with a Thunderbolt for another one shot. Heracross is next and that's what the berry was for. A Night Slash is extremely threatening, but first we can outspeed and fire off another Thunderbolt. Heracross connects with the Night Slash, but we tank it before taking the Beetle out with another Thunderbolt. By the way, an Air Slash from Rotom Fan would have made this battle so much easier, but my countless hours of random battles has made me hate Rotom Fan, especially the stupid Air Balloon set, and I must have pushed that form out of my memory. Infernape comes out next, but he doesn't have Shadow Claw yet. All he can use is Flame Wheel, so a Wide Lens boosted Hydro Pump easily takes him out. Last out is Rose Raid, so I switch into True. Rose Raid sets up the Toxic Spikes, so we can set up a little with Curse. Rose Raid actually puts us to sleep with the Grass Whistle, but our Hell Chesto Berry wakes us up immediately as we set up another Curse. Then we're forced to use Cut, since True has sort of been my HM guy so far, and it nearly gets the one shot. Their next Grass Whistle misses, so we connect with the next attack to take him out, winning us a well deserved victory. Our next hurdle is Byron, who's rocking some powerful steel types. His lead Magneton can be dealt with by our quad effective Hidden Power Ground, so I start the battle with D. But D's attack output is just so bad, and we barely miss out on the kill. In return, Magneton fires back with a powerful Thunderbolt, nearly taking us out, but we also barely manage to hang on. Byron's gonna heal here, so I stay in and use another Hidden Power. I thought maybe the first one was a bad roll, but no, it turns out we just can't do any real damage. I decide to switch into True on the next attack, but Magneton instead goes for a try attack. We're able to tank it pretty well as we take him out with a Rock Smash, which brings out Byron's Steelix. He's got Ice Fang, so I switch into Rom to tank it. Then our Wide Lens boosted Hydro Pump misses as Steelix only sets up a Sandstorm. But since Steelix isn't a rock type, he doesn't get the special defense boost, letting us connect with our next attack to one-shot the Leviathan. Byron's final Pokemon is his Bastiodon, and this guy actually gives us problems. His Metal Burst is basically a counter and mirror move wrapped up in one move, so we need to tread carefully. I first switch into Lax as Bastiodon nails us with a Stone Edge. My strategy is to go for Lick, not for the damage, but for the paralysis. We have a 30% chance for it to activate, and while we don't get it on the first one, after tanking a Stone Edge, our second one scores the Paralysis. Then I switch out into Dawn so we can start going for Swagger. With the Paralysis and the Confusion, Bastiodon has less chances to connect if he goes for Metal Burst, and with everything set up, we bring Rom back out for the final blow. We connect with the powerful Hydro Pump, but Bastiodon survives on 1 HP. That's not sturdy, that's just sheer Bastiodon bulk. His Citrus Berry lets him heal a bit, but now we're two stages away from being wiped out by a Metal Burst. First is Confusion, but he snaps out on this exact turn. Next is Paralysis, but he dodges it and goes for an Iron Defense. Huh? That must be the throw of the century, because now we can connect with a Thunderbolt on the next turn, taking Bastiodon out and winning us our 6th Gym Badge. There's some Team Galactic stuff to take care of with Pearl and Platinum, but the Saturn and Mars matches aren't very noteworthy. What is noteworthy is our next encounter as we approach Snowpoint City, that being Mu the Swineup. In the manga, Mu was actually caught by Platinum because he reminded her of Diamond. She gifted him to Diamond and he instantly became a powerhouse on the team, being able to ram through walls with his powerful tusks. That's perfect timing because inside Snowpoint City, we meet Mindy, who offers us to trade a hard-earned Metacham for a Haunter. 
It's time to take on the Snowpoint City Gym, but before we can challenge her, guess who's hanging out at the Pokemon Center? That's a really nice touch, it makes the world seem that much more connected. Anyway, in order to prepare for the upcoming battle, we made a few preparations, including changing Rom into his oven form. We also go to the Move Reminder to teach Moo Ancient Power, that way he can unlock his caveman roots and evolve into the powerful Mamoswine. Against Candice, she leads with Sneasel, and I start the battle with True. We are quad weak to her ice moves, and I was gonna bring a Yachi Berry to guarantee a surviving Ice Shard, but I stored a Fergore, so we've gotta tank it. Luckily, it doesn't deal more than half, and a Rock Smash in return is able to take her out. Abomasnow comes out next, and she threatens Avalanche, so I switch into Rom. A quad effective overheat, with its accuracy boosted by the wide lens, is enough to secure the knockout, but now as Frostlass comes out, it's not looking great. Her Snow Cloak ability gives her an evasion boost, so I switch into Lax on the turn she sets up Double Team. Then, as Frostlass continues to set up, I switch the weather using Sunny Day. This stops her blizzards from having 100% accuracy, but of course she connects on the next turn. I wish we had Thick Fat, but Lax is running pickup, so we need to tank a fairly hard hit. We fish for an attack with Lick as Frostlass keeps setting up double team, but we're able to bypass her plus 3 evasion and land a critical hit, even getting the lucky para. On the next turn, she misses a blizzard as we instead connect with another Lick. Her Citrus Berry gives her some recovery, but on the following turn, she manages to connect with Blizzard, which does a little more than I was comfortable with. Our Licks aren't doing enough damage, so I switch into Dawn to sponge the next Blizzard. Then, we can outspeed and land a Swagger, and that combined with the Paralysis Chance somehow still doesn't stop Frostlass as she connects with the Shadow Ball, but the damage is pitiful. We can go for an Ancient Power, but Dawn's special attack isn't very good, so Frostlass tanks it and snaps out of confusion, setting up yet another double team. Candice definitely heals here, so I use this opportunity to get a safe switch into Rom. Frostlass keeps setting up double team, so we can go for Shockwave to safely bypass her evasion boost. It doesn't do as much as I would've wanted, and on the next turn, Frostlass changes her plans and uses Shadow Ball. We tank it and fire back with another Shockwave, but now we've got to switch out. Kit is immune to the Shadow Ball, but on the next turn, Frostlass connects with the Blizzard, which doesn't do enough to break through our bulk as we fire back with the Surf, which, despite the plus 4 evasion boost, manages to connect and take out her ace. Last up is Piloswine, but a few more Surfs from Kit can take her out, letting us win a fairly straightforward 7th Gym Badge. Next up is some Team Galactic story, but I spent a long time trying to figure out where to go. It turns out, you need to talk to this random grunt who agrees to give you the key to their warehouse. Maybe I mashed A too hard because I totally missed that and spent a considerable amount of time wandering around the entire region. With our new key though, we can team up with Looker and storm through the Galactic Headquarters. A polka doll in the bed, now that's a nice touch. Cyrus is in the middle of a speech, and this moment is really so cool. To see all their little blue heads listening to Cyrus talk, this feels like something a fan game would do, but here it is in the mainline Platinum. We storm through the rest of the building, stealing their items, and taking out Cyrus on the way out. This isn't his final team, so the battle isn't challenging at all. My fellow Team Galactic members, please scroll down and press the like button on this video, and also subscribe. It really helps me out and I appreciate each and every- oh. They all left. Well, with all the grunts cleared out, we can make our way to the secret basements where Team Galactic conducts all their shady experiments. you you came all the way here just to save some Pokemon? Well, I was just exploring around, but I guess I can do that too. Saturn, after all, is a total pushover, so we can easily defeat her and free the Lake Trio, but we're too late to stop Cyrus. He's already built the Red Chain, so we rush to Spear Pillar to put a stop to his plans. Mars and Jupiter try to stop us, but Pearl and I team up to take them out. I taught Kit the Flamethrower TM from the Veilstone Game Corner, so we can easily deal with the Bronzors. I also start using Surf to kill Pearl's Munchlax faster, that way he can send out the more useful team members like Infernape, Staraptor, and Floatzel. Yeah, we basically let Pearl tank all the attacks for this one, but hey, we're the ones doing the hardcore Nuzlocke, not him. 
Unfortunately, it's too late as Cyrus uses the red chain to summon Dialga and Palkia and in all the commotion, we get some unexpected visitors as well as Giratina breaks through into the mortal world. The lake trio jumps in, so Cynthia and I follow suit as we get ready to take on the endgame. It's my first time going through the distortion world and it honestly blew me away. Jumping around between the platforms feels so fun, Giratina flying above us adds so much to the uneasy atmosphere, and seeing a sideways Cynthia on the ledge as we struggle to solve the puzzles is a cherry on top. In order to exit this labyrinth, we've got to make our way down where Cyrus stands in our way. This is the last notorious run ender, and we've brought a team prepared to take him on. Cyrus leads with Houndoom, so we start the battle with Moo. Houndoom loves using Will-O-Wisp, but he actually misses his attack. This gives Moo the opportunity to fire back with an Earthquake, which of course gets the easy one-shot. Cyrus sends out Gyarados next, and a waterfall's gonna sting, so I switch into Kit to sponge it with her high bulk. On the next turn, we survive yet another waterfall, dodging the flinch and firing back with the quad-effective Thunderbolt, which just misses out on the kill. Luckily, Cyrus always heals here, so we are completely safe to stay in and fire off another attack. This time, we do get the high roll, taking out Gyarados as Cyrus sends out his Honchkrow. I'm expecting a physical move, so I switch into Dawn, our best option to tank those. The Night Slash doesn't do enough, and Honchkrow's definitely switching to Heat Wave, so we're not a bad answer to his Crow. Honchkrow actually misses his Heat Wave, which lets us get off a Swagger to confuse him. On the next turn, he actually dodges the confusion and fires off a plus 2 Night Slash, but we can very comfortably tank it and fire back with the Rock Tomb of our own. Then, with his speed lowered, Honchkrow hits himself on the next turn, nearly taking himself out, but we end up missing our Rock Tomb. He then snaps out of confusion and, using our plus 2 against us, fires off a Night Slash into our Dawn. But it's all for nothing, as another Rock Tomb connects to take him out, which now brings out Weavile. We get faked out for 2 damage, and on the next turn, we tank a soft ice punch before missing our rock tomb. We've got another shot here as Weavile fires off a second ice punch, which manages to freeze us. We can't thaw out, so I've gotta switch into Moo. Weavile continues using ice punch, but a few earthquakes later and Weavile finally goes down. Last out is Crobat, but we've got a good answer to his bat, that being Rom and their stab Thunderbolt. A single bolt is enough for the one shot, winning us the battle and letting us continue forward. We got pretty beat up there, but the important part is, we didn't lose anyone. True and Lax, I hope you enjoyed watching that battle, because we were getting shredded out there. Lax, you're getting sacked at the first opportunity, don't think that you're safe just because you're cute. We make our way over to the end of the path, where Giratina challenges us to a battle, but truthfully, this one isn't difficult at all, as Mu two shots him with Ice Fang. So, with all the Distortion World story wrapped up, we can jump through the portal to make our way back to the real world to continue our gym quest. Sunny Shore is finally accessible to us, but with True and Moo on our team, this gym was never going to be a challenge. He leads with Jolteon, so we start the battle with Moo. Jolteon outspeeds with an Iron Tail, but we tank it and fire back with an Earthquake for the one-shot. Raichu comes out next, and fearing a Focus Blast, I switch into Rom. I guess it's not completely foolproof, but at least we can resist his signal beam and fire back with a shadow ball. Raichu then tries to set up with charge beam, but we can take him out immediately after with a shadow ball. Volkner sends out Luxray, but he threatens Crunch for Rom and Ice Fang for True. We've got a good switch in though, that being Dawn with his high defenses. We can tank his Thunder Fangs as we fire back with Metal Burst, returning his damage back to him to take him out. Volkner's last Pokemon is his Electivire, so I switch into Rom on a resisted Thunder Punch. We can outspeed and fire off a Shadow Ball, which is looking like a two-shot, but his health Citrus Berry brings him back into the green. We go back and forth a little, and after Volkner heals, we're able to take him out with a few more Shadow Balls, winning us the battle and our 8th Gym Badge. With all badges collected, it's time to make our way through Victory Road to take on the Elite Four. We have a few close calls, like True not being able to take out a Rampardos, which lets him get off a Screech, and then True misses his next attack, so Rampardos nearly takes us out with Head Smash. But we can very fortunately tank it as he knocks himself out to the recoil. Arceus was definitely watching over us for that one, because that was too close for comfort. But with no other dangerous plays, we can make our way to the Pokemon League to prepare for our final gauntlet. 
Pearl actually ambushes us before the fight, which I knew was coming, but I didn't realize that this tile also activated his battle. Luckily, I was in the process of leveling up the team, so we're able to hold our ground. Rom takes out Staraptor with the Thunderbolt, as well as his follow-up Floatzel. This baits out Roseraid because the AI sees the kill with Shadow Ball, but Kit can come in to sponge the attack and fire back with Flamethrower. Pearl actually switches out into Infernape, but we can switch to Surf to take him out. Heracross is next, and that coverage of close combat and Night Slash is devastating for our team, but a little bit of pivoting between Rom for close combat and Dawn for Night Slash lets us stall him out of the 5pp for close combat, so once he's ran out, Dawn can safely come in and take him out with a few Iron Heads. We also set up a layer of Stealth Rocks, and that's a surprise tool that'll help us later. Pearl sends out Snorlax next, so I switch into True on a resisted Earthquake, before taking him out with a few Earthquakes of our own. Last is Rose Raid, but with the rocks we set up earlier, he's dead on arrival as we've now cleared through the final rival fight. All that's left in front of us is the Elite Four, and we've got a great team to take them on. First up against AA Ron, he starts with Yan Mega as we lead with Moo. But with some speed EVs, we can outspeed on the first turn and connect with the Rock Slide, getting a clean one-shot before he can boost up his speed. This baits out Caesar, who wants to use Iron Head, so we switch into Kit. We're packing the powerful Flamethrower, and that's another quad effective one-shot. AA Ron sends out Heracross next, presumably to use close combat, so we can switch into Rom. Now, we're at risk to a Night Slash, but we can first outspeed and land a Thunderbolt. We're decently bulky too, so we tank the attack before taking him out with another Thunderbolt on the following turn. Eren sends out Vespiquin, but Thunderbolt can one-shot her as well. That leaves his last Pokemon, his Drapion, but the poor guy can't really touch us. So a couple more Thunderbolts are enough to take out the Scorpion, winning us the first Elite Four battle. Bertha is up next, and she deals with ground types. But almost every member on her team goes down to a quad effective attack. Her Whiskash can't survive a single Razor Leaf, which gets us an easy one-shot. Out comes Gliscor, so I switch into Moo. We can tank his Ice Fang while firing off with an Ice Fang of our own, and we can show him who's the better cross-gen evolution. Bertha sends out Golem next, so I switch into True before taking her out with another Razor Leaf. This baits out her Ace Rhyperior, who will always click Avalanche here, but I don't trust that True can break through her high defense with a pathetic Razor Leaf. So instead, I switch out into Rom, and with the held wide lens, we can land a quad effective Hydro Pump to take her out. Last up is Hapowdon, but by once again targeting her weaker special defense, we can connect with another Hydro Pump to secure the KO, winning us the second Elite Four battle. Against Flint, we have so many answers to his team that this battle isn't even noteworthy. He starts with Houndoom, so we lead with Kit. We can sponge his flamethrower decently well, but the lucky hound actually lands a 10% burn. Fortunately, that doesn't affect our attacks as we're only rocking special moves, as a super effective, expert belt boosted surf can one shot him in return. Flint sends out Infernape next, and I was expecting a mock punch, so I switch into Rom, but Infernape instead goes for Flare Blitz. Since Rotom doesn't actually get the type change with each form until Gen 5, Flare Blitz ends up being a neutral hit and does a decent amount of damage. But with our team being pretty weak to fire defensively, we need to tank another one, which we're able to do without a single drop of sweat. Rom then fires back with a Hydro Pump, which is a little sweaty, but we're able to connect and take Infernape out. Flint sends out Flareon, so we've got to switch out. I go into Dawn to tank the Overheat, which is the strongest attack he can throw at us. That keeps lowering their special attack as well, so we're completely free to set up a Stealth Rock and start chipping away with Stone Edge. With all the residual damage, we're getting a little low ourselves, so I switch into Kit on a minus 4 Overheat. Then, we tank a Quick Attack before taking Flareon out with a Surf. Rapidash comes out next, so I switch into Moo as Rapidash takes to the skies. On the next turn, his bounce connects, but we can fire back with the Rock Slide for the clean KO after the Stealth Rock chip. Finally, out comes Flint's Magmortar, who takes a bit more from the Stealth Rocks, but we stay in and fire off an Earthquake, outspeeding and knocking him out in one hit, making this 3 down with 1 to go. Our last obstacle is Lucian, who starts with Mr. Mime as we lead with Rom. We start the battle by outspeeding and firing off a Shadow Ball, which can secure an easy one-shot. 
This causes the AI to send out Espeon, who's gonna try and use Shadow Ball, so that gives us a clean switch to Kit. Espeon outspeeds on the next turn, landing a critical hit Psychic, bringing us down to the yellow, but we fire back with a Thunderbolt. That crit cut our time short, so we've gotta switch into Dawn to resist the Psychic. That's the best Espeon can use against us, so we tank them as we fire back with Stone Edge, and this time, we get the crit to take them out. This baits out Lucian's Glade, who's gonna try and use Drain Punch, so I switch into Rom. Then, a critical hit Shadow Ball is enough to take him out, but even without the crit, we had enough bulk to tank anything Glade threw at us, even if a Psycho Cut had crit us. Lucian sends out Bronzong next, so we stay in and start going for Thunderbolt. We do a decent amount of damage, but Bronzong decides to go for a Calm Mind instead. So on the next turn, we have just enough juice to squeeze out the 2-hit KO, letting Rom stay at full HP as his final Alakazam comes out. But this Alakazam isn't running Shadow Ball, so we can stay in and tank a Psychic before firing back with our own Shadow Ball, knocking him out and winning us the battle. Now, there's only one battle that stands in the way of our victory, and her team packs quite the punch. We use our last minute TMs to finalize our strategy, and with everything ready, we head in for the final fight. Cue the piano music! With her elegant dress flowing in the breeze, Cynthia lowers her head and sends out Spiritomb as we start the battle with Dawn. Spiritomb outspeeds us and fires off a Dark Pulse, which even though we resist all our attacks, still manages to flinch us. We try again on the next turn, but this time, we're able to dodge the flinch and set up a Stealth Rock. With his job now complete, we stay in and continue tanking Dark Pulses as we fire back with Stone Edge. We do switch to Iron Head for the better accuracy, but after witnessing such a brilliant strategy, the AI learns and switches to Lucario to resist it. Of course, we miss our Stone Edge, so I need to switch into Rom on the incoming Aura Sphere. Then, we can outspeed ourselves and fire off a Thunderbolt, which brings Lucario down to the yellow and even paralyzes him. He manages to break through the para and fire back with the Shadow Ball, but we can tank it. Another Thunderbolt later, and that's Cynthia's Fursona taken care of. At this point, Spiritomb comes back out, so I went for the easy kill, but after the Stealth Rock chip, the AI decides to heal with the full restore. Luckily, a Shadow Ball does more than half, so on the next turn, we can safely stay in and use another one to take them out. For some reason, Cynthia decides to send out her Garchomp, and all of a sudden, we're staring down her most intimidating Pokemon. But from Garchomp's moveset, two of them can't hit us since we retain our Ghost type in Gen 4, and we also have the Levitate ability. I use Protect to scout what she's gonna use, and we reveal that she's going for a Dragon Rush. We are definitely not living that, so I need a switch. I send out Dawn, who can resist the attack with his Steel typing, and that buys us another turn. Another quick protect reveals that she's going for the obvious earthquake, so now I need to make a decision. We can switch around between Dawn and Rom to use up her moves, but eventually Dawn won't be able to withstand all those dragon rushes. It's clear that no matter which way we look at it, someone's gonna have to go down. I look at Lax, our little warrior who's been with us since the beginning, and we both know it's time. Bringing him into the Elite Four already seemed too good to begin with, and even though he's the baby of our group, I'm sure he knows what he has to do. With one last look at each other, I get ready to send him out, but Don stops me. He looks at me with a great sadness in his eyes, not willing to let our little friend go. He's only a baby after all, with his whole life ahead of him. Don raises his heavy head, and I can sense the silent communication between us. I nod back, issuing one final command to attack. The arena shakes as Garchomp unleashes her powerful earthquake, the very ground beneath us quivering in response. The dust settles, and from the center of the battlefield, Dawn finally collapses. But his sacrifice is not in vain. This gives us the opportunity to send out Kit, and after Garchomp mercifully misses a Dragon Rush, we can fire back with the 4x super effective Ice Beam that obliterates her ace. Cynthia sends out Togekiss next, who does threaten Aura Sphere, but that's a safe switch into Rom. Then, a Thunderbolt is enough to one-shot him out of the sky, without risking any of our health to do so. Milotic is up next, so we can first protect to see what she plans to use. This reveals that she's going for Mirror Coat, and considering how bulky Milotic can be, we are definitely not going to be able to one-shot her. 
Since she's probably only going for Miracle, we have a safe switch into anyone we want, and there's only one man for the job. Or, I guess, one baby for the job. We bring out Lax, who can outspeed and land a Toxic on the Sea Serpent. This now puts Milotic on a timer as she foolishly tries to use Miracoat. Then, on the next turn, our Quick Claw activates, allowing us to outspeed again and land a fast attract. With the love immobilizing her 50% of the time, the toxic poison racking up, and our max power returns chipping away at her health, we're able to fell this mighty serpent with just our little baby. Cynthia's last Pokemon is Rose Raid, and I can tell she's getting a little desperate. She sets up her own toxic against us, but we respond back with another attract. We're on the timer now, but on the next turn, Rose Raid actually wins the coin flip and fires off a sludge bomb, bringing us to the yellow as we fire back with a return, which actually one-shots her. Rose Raid goes down, and that's Cynthia defeated, all thanks to Dawn's heroic sacrifice and the power of a boy and his max friendship baby. And with that, our journey as Diamond through the Sinnoh region comes to an end. This was actually my first time beating Platinum, and it was a genuinely beautiful game. I can't believe I let the flaws of the original Diamond and Pearl blind my judgement for so long, but I'm so glad that I finally got around to it and that I could share my journey with you guys. If you'd like to see the other Dex holders, make sure you click here to see how I beat Pokemon Heart Gold using Gold's team. Appreciate you for being here, and thanks for sticking around all the way to the end of the video. Until next time, this has been Magnus. I'll catch you all in the next video. Peace.